On today's episode of Yang Speaks, we're talking about Carly's trip to Miami Hack Week. We are talking about Andrew Cuomo resigning, but most importantly, we're talking deep fakes on Yang Speaks today. So welcome back, everybody. Glad you've tuned in. Carly, welcome back from Miami. How is your sunburn? Because oh this has been an adventure in the household here. But yeah, my sunburn is has been excruciating. Though I will say the internet has provided a lot of relief in the sense that I feel like I know what the trajectory of a sunburn is. So I've now learned that 48 day, 48 hours post sunburn is the worst. So I'm, yep. I'm now kind of over the hump. And but yeah, I like basically couldn't wear a shirt yesterday. Not to if get inappropriate, but if you've ever had it that bad sunburn, guys, it's horrendous. I had it in college once where like it was just itching and you're going nuts. Uh, the best thing I can tell you, I had a buddy of mine who is who served in Iraq who got sunburned so severely and did not have any aloe. The key is aloe and anything you can find in that realm. But if you don't have that, cold shower, no soap, cold ice cold shower. It's so cool painful, down the skin, though. big time. Uh, don't use any soap or anything. And then aloe if you can get it. But cold shower helps, especially right after. Um, so at least that's his tip. It worked for me. We got burnt real bad and we just took massively cold showers. But that's showers. a fun spin on the, the graduation spe speech, right? Like there's a famous graduation speech that's like, don't forget the sunscreen. And we can update it and be like, but if you do, but if you do, a take shower. a cold shower. <laughs> I don't know whose speech that is, but that sounds fun. Um, anyway... You met some really cool people. Two of them we're going to have on this podcast. Um, what did you? What's your big takeaway from going down to Miami's? Miami's recruiting crypto engineers, so they had a hack week. What's your takeaway, Carl? My, my takeaway is I love nerds, and I love spending time with them. And then I think it has only re-solidified my commitment to this world of blockchain, crypto, the future. I think this is a really awesome group of people and I would bet on them any day of the week and I am betting on them and it's going quite well thus far. So this is true. <laughs> um, so before we get in there, let's do a couple of things I think are worth talking about quickly. Um, big news that happened today. We're recording this on August, Tuesday, August 10th. You're hearing this on Thursday, the 12th um, or around then. Governor Andrew Cuomo has officially resigned. Uh, Governor of New York here. Here's my quick hot take, my rationally average a take uh, here. Okay, I, on a human level, there are some conservative values like limited government and like making it easier to do business that I align with. Um, and I think I've made that somewhat clear on this podcast. Um, but I'm a Democrat because I believe generally that the Democrats are trying to be the good guys and have empathy and take care of our least fortunate. Which is to me why the Cuomo thing is very frustrating um, because it's the hypocrisy and it, you see it across the Democratic Party a lot. Um, so you're trying, you're part of the good guy, you're saying you're a good guy, you're playing on the good guy team, if you will, but then you're a fucking predator. Like what the hell? And on one end, now anyone listening to this would be like, well, Republicans are substantially worse. And I would agree, generally speaking, um, or depending, you know, case by case, but generally speaking, yes. But Republicans, in some ways, uh, own the fact that they're assholes. Like, they don't right. pretend to be someone they're not. And there's a certain odd amount of respect I have for people that just own their shittiness, as opposed yeah. to pretending, being a wolf in sheep's clothing, pretending to be a good guy, and then being a freaking predator. And which is why democratic hypocrisy really, really bothers me. So, um, I don't know what your thoughts are, but that is my Cuomo take of the day. Yeah, I, I think... I agree with that. I think it's really frustrating when you have people on our own team who are making us look bad. Uh, and the other thing is, I feel like we haven't made enough of the the um, nursing home deaths. Like, I feel like that's oh, yeah. something that the Republicans have hammered really hard, and that was like Fox News' big talking point. But the Democrats now are, are, are reckoning with the Cuomo thing over the women front, but I don't feel like we've reckoned enough with the fact that, like, for a while, that to me felt like it was worse than the women's scandal. Now you've had more women come out. It, it sort of changed. But like for a while, it was like, what? Like we're just going to gloss over this? And you want to talk about hypocrisy. I mean, this was the dude who wrote the book on like how to handle the COVID mm. pandemic. Like, yeah. And I think yeah. that's, that's also just part of this takeaway is to think about, 
I mean, I read an article. What we're being sold? How's that? Sorry. Well, I read an article, or uh, but I read an article in Glamour magazine or whatever it was, like in the beginning of the pandemic, you know, talking about how Cuomo's her boyfriend, like a whole like kind of funny article the about Cuomo how in love she is with Cuomo. Yeah, yes. yeah, I'm a Cuomo sexual. Exactly. Like this, like this dude was so propped up in so many ways, and at the time, I remember feeling like it was rhetoric over substance. It felt like I, I'm not hearing enough about what Cuomo's actually doing. I just hear that people are really turned on by his briefings at the end of the night because he can form a complete sentence and Trump, mm -hmm. our president at the we time, We were looking in. at the time for strong leadership and for, in many ways, he is a strong leader. He is a strong personality. He is bold. He is yes. decisive. He is articulate. He is calm in, in a crisis. All those things. He's also a predator. He also appears to be a liar. He also appears, not appears, there's also strong, there's a strong evidence uh, that he has a very hostile workplace and people are terrified right. of fucking working for him. I, look, you don't deserve these jobs. We don't, as people, we should not be tolerating this. I'm glad he's resigning. I'm glad we're getting rid of him. Screw that guy. I feel I'm proud of all the women who stood up and said something. I'm ashamed of all the people who let it go on for probably decades. It's fucked up. Um, there was this defense, at least in the beginning, that's like, all right, he's just kind of a creepier old guy, like Generation Gap, a little touchy feely. But Italian, the reports were, intense. yeah, but the reports were I pretty. Know. I read the reports; they're pretty bad. He's like roping yeah. women up their shirt and mentioning very creepy conduct. And when there's smoke, there's fire, and it's eleven women all saying the same pattern of behavior. It's not one or two one-offs. It's not a crate. You know, there's you take all these. I believe you take these all case by case. Um, but we should believe women when they're saying stuff in the sense that we should listen. Um, and understand why they're saying something um, and give them the same air cover that men get, but, um, or at least platform to say things. But, and this was pretty dark. Um, so it sucks to lose a strong, quote unquote, strong democratic governor of our biggest or one of our biggest states being ours in the democratic party, but can't have this. Uh, bad for the party, bad for the country, bad for the women, um, bad for him, bad for everybody. This sucks. Um, so sorry to start this pod off with negative and, news, but it's not but fun. But best of luck to, to Kathy Hochul and, and very cool if I'm pronouncing her last name right. And then yeah. uh, and excited to have our best of luck to New York State. Female governor of New York State. One requirement for the new governor is that they need to keep the Buffalo Bills in New York and they need to let <laughs> us build a new stadium. So that's all I really care about. Um, let's talk about the real issues. Um, so before we dive in, we have a really fun conversation on deep fakes, which blew my freaking mind. Um, but the last thing I wanna say before we get to deep fakes is um, was checking out, for those of you who've been listening, Carly made a call on something, uh, NFT, a non-fungible token called a gift goat that Gary Vaynerchuk is doing. And I uh, went in and checked, we didn't get one because of some logistical complications and they were for sale for three ETH when ETH was at, let's call it $1,800. We were buying um, it for five ETH. Five okay, five ETH. Um, and I just went and peeped that price and they are being sold online for 35 ETH. So um, that's a hundred grand. Uh, that's a down payment on a home, um, I guess, right? Um, or a whole bunch of things. And so we're pissed. So hopefully I'll took our actual Carly's investment advice. Gift goats to the moon. Um, probably still going up. Damn. So... I will, I will also, like my second plug for V Friends is I, I do own two V Friends, um, not the gift goats, but other NFTs from this overall drop. And because I'm a V Friend holder, I was you keep giving you more gifted shit. an additional NFT, something called an Avastar for free that I already have offers on for like 600 bucks. So the blogs are again, just I can afford my retainers. I'm not trying to be a jerk. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I've stopped doubting. Gift goats to the moon. Anyway. Gift goats to the moon, baby. Um, tell All us right. about who we got coming on, Carl. Yeah, I'm super excited about this. So when I was in Miami for this hackathon, um, also if anybody wants to like learn more about hackathons, DM me. I'm like very nerdy into hackathons at this point. Sweet. Um, and this was a really cool one. So uh, I met a number of really cool people and... I had this awesome calling card, which is co-hosting this podcast. So when I found people that I thought were special or interesting, you know, I would I would connect with them and, and ask them to come on the show. So we'll probably have a couple more of these interviews, but these next two people, they're super impressive young folks who are at this hackathon, um, both with backgrounds in AI, machine learning, um, and they're building, they built a very cool deep fake product. We can't get into the specifics of it because they're in the process well, in like of VSA, raising info. money for it. And so they like are trying to keep it 
kind of stealth, but we were able to have a broader conversation with them around deep fakes. Um, and I can tell you they are legit because I've seen the deep fake, I saw the deep fake they built over the course of this week-long hackathon. Very cool. It is Alex Lazar and Francesca Callejos. So very excited to have them both on the pod and talking to us about the future They're of deep fakes. They're 23-year-old babies who know more about the future of the tech and the world. It was yeah. mind-blowing. Deep fakes are cool. terrifying and awesome. You guys are gonna yeah. love this. Tune in, deep fake conversation on Yang Speaks right now. Very excited to welcome Alex Lazar and Francesca Callejas to Yang Speaks. I met these two in Miami this past week during Miami Hack Week. They were working on some very cool stuff and they built a deep fake of one of the Miami Hackathon organizers. And it was so cool. I wanted to have them on for a bigger conversation about deep fakes, the technology, where this might all be going. Uh, it's crazy. So it's terrifying and awesome. <laughs> and anything that's terrifying and awesome is worth talking about. Um, let's do this assuming no one knows anything. So I guess I'll start with you, Alex, because you're nodding more passionately than Francesca, something personal. If you're watching the video. Uh, but maybe, or you either have the best answer, but let me start with you, Alex. Uh, can you explain? Let's say it's my mother. She's in her mm -hmm. early 60s. What a deep mm -hmm. fake is. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think the simplest way to explain a deep fake is just like the first term, I would say it's synthetic media. It's not real. It's like you're creating some type of new media. And that media specifically is in which a person uh, in an existing image is replaced by or a video is replaced by a person or a video from another video. So imagine like right now we're able to swap your face, Zach, onto Carly's face. And mm -hmm. it sounded like you, Zach. It moved like you, but it was still on like Carly's body and everything. So anything to add to that, Francesca? Um, no, I think that was a really good summary. I think, I think the main thing to hone in on is like, it is completely computer generated synthetic video and even audio. Mm -hmm. Does someone have to actually do it for you to put a deep fake on top of it? So if like, does I have to say, I have to do the action or say the words or be on the screen and then you layer on someone else's face. So it's real in some way, but not the real person doing it. It could go to both ways. So you could, let's say you had like Carly's face, but you wanted your voice. Um, and there are, there is deep fake technology where we could get Carly to move her lips, her eyes, the lighting and everything. Exactly. <laughs> but it'll be your voice, Zach, coming out. Oh, that or would advice. Be yeah. <laughs> We don't need or there's that. even, yeah, or there's even like the creepier ones where you can kind of like superimpose your face, Zach, with your movements directly onto Carly. Oh boy. So, <laughs> but it does, but it's not like you can make Carly do anything. You have to, someone else has to do it and then you can make it look like Carly did that thing. Is that fair? And does, is the technology going to a place where you can just make real people look like, you know, no one has to actually act it out? Um, or is that the core of the tech? I think typically the way it works is that basically like at a very high level, what we're doing is like sophisticatedly in a sophisticated way, we are overlaying two images or videos on top of one another. And then you're mm -hmm. taking the components of it that you would want and computer generating like kind of the parts of it that weren't there to begin with. So like maybe movements that weren't exactly made. So like to make your mouth mm -hmm. look as though you were saying whatever Carly was saying, for example. Um, so like at a high level, the way the technology works right now is like you would need a background of what you want the new superimposed layer to look like. So you would need some kind of, um, yeah, like actor in the background or like creator in the backgrounds that could be acting out the movements of what you would want the like deep faked version to do. Mm -hmm. And the technology is though getting to a place I would say where it's like if we would, let's say Zach, uh, created a machine learning or AI model of your voice then and had some good video of you, we would be able to create a deep fake of you saying whatever we wanted saying to say. Exactly. That's kind of like, like you kind of said, the next evolution. And it's going to get more and more, let's call it uh, ambiguous or empowering to the mm -hmm. coder, if you will, the engineer to make people look like they're doing what we want. Um, okay. 
whole bunch of questions. Carly, you know more about this mm -hmm. than I do, so I'm just gonna ask a dumb question. So first things first, are they easy to spot if they're fake? Or do they look and feel real? Like what, like, um, like is how it like, you know, like right certain now? experts can tell something's been Photoshopped. Um, mm -hmm. Is that this case for deep fakes or are they like unrecognizable and someone has to like publicly say that's a deep fake? I would say there's like a two part answer to that. There is like kind of an ongoing, um, like in kind of like the world of like, you know, internet fakes, just in terms of like, you know, fake news. And there's kind of also like an education process, I would say, going on in the world of like people trying to identify like deep fakes. And that's a, such a big question that's going on. There's actually been legislation that's been introduced. Um, I know DARPA actually has all the time like events where they have people say like, hey, like we'll pay you. This is a crowdsourced event. We're trying to figure out ways that A, we can identify deep fakes and B, ways that we could stop the spread of deep fakes if they were to be identified. So this is something that's like, constantly being investigated and constantly uh, being looked into just because as you could imagine, like you guys are saying, um, if we were to make deep fakes of you and take over Yang Speaks, I don't think that would be good for anybody. Well, if you make me sound smarter and or better looking, I'm in. If not, then that's a problem. Um, okay, this is, oh my, okay. So I'm, Charlie, I'm just gonna keep dabbing. Um, Go. I have two use cases I want y'all's opinions on. Uh, one is Go wholesome and one's kind of weird and maybe a little dark. Um, let's start with the wholesome one is Hollywood. So theoretically, could I have a bad actor, a cheap actor, go in and shoot a movie and then I deep fake Leonardo DiCaprio on him. So I have to, I can pay for Leo's like license, but I don't have to pay for his time and all that other crap and save a bunch of money. Is that, a, that in the future? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting use case because this has been used in Hollywood already. Um, there's like really? previous technology. Yeah. So one of the way, uh, did you guys get a chance to watch the Irish man that just came out on Netflix? The one that came out a couple years ago, the this older movie film? or the with Robert like, De Niro. It's like yeah, the famous yes. movie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, yes. we had a, okay. not that one. whatever. We had not a that early old, date sorry. watching that movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's an incredible movie. Cool. Um, very long. Yeah. Movie. So like five yes, freaking hours long. long. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's a very long movie. Yes. Um, but what they did was that they paid millions and millions of dollars to come up with this de-aging technology so that Robert De Niro looked like decades younger in the film and Al Pacino. Um, so, ah, it's like, By the way, this movie isn't it, that old. It won the Academy Award last year. So sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is how long No, it's, it's like. not that old. Yeah. No, but that that's why they it was they, what they wanted was to see like a young Robert De Niro in the film rather than like younger like today's day and age robert de niro what? so they yeah so again so netflix paid like millions and millions of dollars for um uh, this like sophisticated technology that could de-age yeah some of these actors in the film including al pacino and robert de niro um but um deep fakes were actually able to do this so much better so they were using this technology called vpx i think something like that um but it's definitely not as sophisticated as deep fake so what deep so some YouTuber came in and within seven days used this open source technology. So it was entirely free and came up with a way to de-age these same actors much better. So he like posted ah. this video, went viral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it went viral because people- Send me this video, we'll put in the like, link. That's awesome. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send it. It was so fascinating because people were like, oh, this is so much better. Like when Netflix comes <laughs> and uses, I, the, this YouTuber's name is iFake, they're like, when. When YouTube comes in and uses iFake's version of the movie, then I'll go ahead and watch it again. But this one's <laughs> so much better. Um, so there are already like some use cases for doing this in Hollywood, which is interesting. But it's just I think we're still a long ways to go from this being like very widely adopted. I think like a use case that you mentioned, like like would Leonardo DiCaprio be okay with his mm -hmm. likeness being sold and not his time? Like would that devalue his? his means as an actor because it, it wouldn't be his acting at that point you would be taking the acting of the like right. lesser actor underneath him and just like overlaying his face on there so i think it like introduces a lot of questions of like what do you actually want from the actor or from from the person who's being used on, as a deep fake um and like like what do you actually care to keep 
Like, yep. is it just or you can make face, someone be like... a different type of character, right? Uh, if they want, mm-hmm. you want them to have longer hair, you want them to have a uh, different color skin right. or in, different gender. In some gender. ways, mm-hmm. it's, it's the reverse of what you're saying, Zach. Instead of buying a crappy actor, it's like you use some like, really good, good actor, actor who maybe doesn't look the doesn't way look you want the, the character to mm-hmm. look and you can superimpose a different look upon They're going to fix all the British actors' teeth is what they're going <laughs> to do. Oh my God. <laughs> we have a long running joke because I like British shows because I have a theory that they are like less committed to having to have only like super hot actors in British shows because so they actually just get oh, better actors because so they don't have to I fully like, agree with that they don't have to look like movie stars I, credit to my mom this was actually her theory originally and I think it's true so they have to I don't think it's theory actors. I think it's true fine uh, better loves... actors because they don't have to make them look like supermodels yeah. all the time we love someone okay. super hot we'd, we'd rather have subpar acting and above average look than the other way around <laughs> Right, and um, Britain's like, we actually care about the craft. Okay, not that's not the point of this. What was your second use case, Zach? So your my second use, use case. case is very strange. We could cut this out if it's uncomfortable, but I think we keep it. My <laughs> Go for it. second use <laughs> case, like I think, is, is pornography. Yeah, mm. and mm. in a world where um, you can... I mean, you get the same porn stars, plural, if you want... Do, making themselves look like different types of people and monetizing the same, um, the, the the their same actions to different audiences because everybody's been porn and people have their different preferences and, and and fetishes or whatever it is. And my question that might the wholesome side of me is like that sounds very theoretically safer because I think one of the biggest challenges of porn industry is very young women like um, like regretting the, you know get, making that career choice. Um, or you don't, you, you you can do this, you know, later in life or when you're older and that sort of thing. But um, the other one is that you could put, you know, an innocent the a girl next door or a teacher or whoever it is in the body of a of a porn star and share that virally, and that's that's horrific. So, th- I mean, thoughts yeah. on the and not only pornography, I guess, but like the dark side of this too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I know there was during my research while I was looking into this, like for this stuff. Um, I did come across like specifically there was one big incident of something exactly almost like you're talking about that happened, which which kind of like spurred this whole conversation, which there was this technology or software that came out. It was um, I don't want to feel embarrassed. To say this, it was called Deep Nude um, and it was actually like a paid for application that used um, this like, same technology that's used to make deep fakes where you could upload a picture of anybody you wanted and it would generate them without clothes. Um, and that was quickly, like, within, I don't know how quickly. I love that some within, coder was like, this is the coolest application. This is the best way to apply this well, technology. I, 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 I don't even know if that's what they thought. But the thing is, like, in kind of like the whole thing surrounding deep fakes, which I think gets everyone so worried, and it's like the perfect example might be pornography, is that it's just getting a little too easy. It's getting to that point where it's like, you know, like there's so many YouTubers, like almost to that last example that you said, where it's like they're able to just make these things almost, which again, which years ago or maybe decades ago, which should have taken millions, if not like entire research agencies from yeah. countries to develop some, maybe within a week or two. In, in some like, idiot you know, in, in their the, basement. Yeah. Ruining exactly. Lives. And exactly. An- another thing to add here is that it, like for everyone that's making technology that, um, yeah, that has good use cases, like you, like the first wholesome use case that you mentioned, like there's always going to be someone that can use that perniciously. And that was like, it, it is already happening, like Alex mentioned. At, at some point they did, I think back in like 2018, they did an audit of like deep fakes out like in the wild web. And it was something like 95% of them were being used for pornography I'm at sure. first. Mm-hmm. So uh, pornography yeah. industry is usually cutting edge tech. They, uh, it's a lot of money. Mm-hmm. They can take risks. Um, endless market. Anyway, sorry. Um, mm-hmm. um, this is, it's one of the things about the internet. I don't know if you guys have seen the, um, the social dilemma with, with Tristan Harris. It was on Netflix, but it was, I mean, he's been, he's been a guest in the pod, but he, he says something so fascinating to me. He's like the, this technology and this advanced in technology are both utopia and dystopia at the same time where it's, it's literally heaven where you can do the most amazing, wholesome, incredible things with the tech and you can have the exact same, like, you know, as awesome mm-hmm. as it is, it's equally as terrible. Um, yeah. And you and guys are on the cutting edge of that. Go ahead, Carly. Okay. So, so talk to us about some other interesting use cases for this. Where is this all going mm-hmm. you know, outside porn, of what Zach and I can even so, imagine? So, 
So I think what's really important to realize is that like the deep fake technology is kind of built on many other AI and machine learning models. And those things like this is just the product of those models, like specifically autoencoders and GANs, which stands for um, general adversary, uh, generative adversarial networks. Um, long story short, those both of those models combined are what are, what are commonly used to make all the deep fakes that you see today. Um, and what they're basically doing at the end of the day is trying to generate something that is real and looks realistic. Um, and one of the big areas where that actually comes into place is two things. One, it can be used a lot in AI for like self-driving cars or image recognition, where it's like, are we trying to determine if this traffic light is real or if it's not? I think mm. there's actually a bug recently in the Tesla software on when there was like a full moon recently, where I think every Tesla was detecting it as like a red light or something. Um, and that was like, you know, a perfect example of this, where it's like, you know, it's maybe it's sending all the information that the car is recognizing. Oh, it, it's giving me all the data that I think it's a light. I'm giving all the data that I should be telling my person in the car that it's a light. But the same technology that's used to almost generate deep fakes um, is used to verify if this is real or not. Mm -hmm. Another common example that it's used is for drug discovery, where it's like they actually will uh, in model like uh, in uh, molecular models uh, on computers, like pick and remove by hand like different molecules and see what the computer generates and they've actually like verified some of these drugs on mice to see if they work or not. So yeah, drug discovery I think, is in okay. prescription drugs, not as in we're discovering heroin in somebody's locker. No, 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 no. Like in a lab. <laughs> exactly. Like okay. in, in, in a lab at like different permutations, like to see yeah. how they would work and not. Oh, mm. Way more wholesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a there's a big overlap between the technology that deep fakes use and like the power of computer vision. And it, uh, that's the technology that Alex was talking about. So computer vision is what powers like Tesla's self-driving car is that they can identify what's on the road as a road, as a street light, as a pedestrian, as another car coming. Mm -hmm. um, you can use this to like um, to like take an image and do some really interesting like analysis of what's going on in the images. That was actually one of the other Hack Week projects that was really cool. They were doing like a like a modern day Theranos, um, mm -hmm. but using computer vision, it wasn't based on chemistry. They were taking, I think, they could probably talk more about the te technology, but they were like taking an image of like the red blood cell counts and using that to determine, um, yeah, what kind of diseases a, an individual uh -huh. can have. So like there's a lot of power behind like the computer vision technology and deep fake is just like, one interesting use case in which um, I think the reason why people are so fascinated by it is because it does like tread the line between like uncanny valley and like reality. Oh, it's a perfect very, moral like, dilemma and it's scary. And mm -hmm. it'll be, this will be like the tip of the sword, I think politically over time. What, let me ask this, like, is there a world, so you talked about in the beginning where you're, you're layering two videos over, right? So you need a real mm -hmm. and then you need the fake and then you, you know, that sort of thing. Um, is there a world where the real is a video game or you have Zach's video game character, which our graphics are getting better and better. Let's say I look close to Zach and you make him up and then you layer on a real Zach on, on top. So then you actually could make me do literally anything um, without a real actor. Is that where this could be going? I imagine yes, but I, I don't know. Yeah, definitely. No, that's mm -hmm. like a very solid use case for it because you would, in this case, you would use the animations from the video game to be the underlying um, right. technology or the underlying actor that you can overlay this technology on top of, which, um, yeah, I, I think that there are use cases in this already, like going back to the like pernicious use cases, like I think they are already doing stuff like this with pornography. So like yeah. it, it does like, yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of ways in which you could already leverage that technology for deep fakes. I think it's just not like out in the wild yet for well, like more wholesome was... use cases. I keep there going back to Hollywood where it's like, why are Pixar movies so good? Because they can edit them forever to make them perfect, mm -hmm. right? And they have lower margin or higher margin, excuse me, like lower costs. Um, so there's a world where you can have all the benefits of a Pixar movie where you can perfect it and cut your costs, but then make it look completely real with famous actors. Um, and I'm saying this out loud. Holy shit! This is gonna be cool. But Go I, ahead, I, th Kyle. I think I think Francesca's point is right, which is that these actors aren't going to agree to this, and there does feel like Thanks. there's mm -hmm. there will be. I think I disagree. I think there'll be money in it. But I agree that like but, a Leo, maybe not, but like an up and comer. Sure, um, sure, but, sure. 
one common thing maybe that we're not considering what about dead actors like yeah using their likeness using their likeness like you know that's even already yes. been done a little bit like in star wars with like um but don't you think the, psychologically the experience as a user and maybe we'll get over this hurdle eventually but like is totally different like why am i i don't want to watch a movie where it's all it's all fake like zach would you watch the buffalo bills the way you typically do if like it wasn't actually any of the real like i don't know it just i think that's different but like i loved it. robin williams would i love to see him again in a new movie hell yeah even though it's not him acting it's it would be his like acting. his ethos and energy and still just as funny. I think there'll be plenty of people that want to see it. Funny. I mean, look, no, if it's not just as funny, no one well, watch it. But if you do it well, it would be. Go ahead, Francesca. Sorry. Well, what if you were able to capture Robin Williams' personality enough that it was his humor? And it yeah. like you, you, the voice would be easy because there's so many movies with his voice. And the acting would be easy because there's so many... There's already so many images of him out there. Like, I, I guess the, the question there would be like, the underlying actor like right. would we be able to use like some of his old videos as underlying actors so that we can even we can even use like him right. to like motivate his new film so i will say there was another interesting deep fake project at miami hack week and it was this gentleman i don't know even what his day job is but he's a, he does a lot on tiktok so he has eight hundred thousand tiktok followers his day job is tiktok come on I don't, I don't, I don't think <laughs> it was, but I, I don't know. <laughs> and so... Yang's core policy to running for mayor, according to the press. Okay, sorry. Okay, so you he... didn't see this? He had, we got he had, a lot no, of shit but, for it. Okay, he, he, had nearly a million, he had nearly a million TikTok followers. And he basically built a deep fake of himself that would go live on his TikTok channel for like... A, he went live for 11 hours straight, but it was his deep fake going live. And he gained 10,000 followers on TikTok mm -hmm. by having his deep fake of himself go live on his own channel. And he said he came to this because he was seeing that when he would go live, people would just ask the same questions over and over again. It was like, how are you? Like, what's up? Like, what are you mm. up to? What'd you have for breakfast? Like, da, 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 da. So he just got to the point where he's able to create enough answers to those that he then was able to, to make himself go live, gain a bunch of followers without actually having to be there and he took like a video of himself at a party while he was mm -hmm. theory going live on tiktok but he, you know like it, it, it's really interesting some of those kind of self-sovereign like creator so uh, examples both for I mean, both for the both of you like one you're incredibly young and impressive so when i was however old you are 19 i was <laughs> I don't think you're quite 19. Drinking but... like an idiot. How old are you? Right. 22, whatever. I'm, um, I'm 23. Okay. 20, also 23. You guys can drink. Okay, cool. But still, um, I wasn't doing what you're doing. Um, let me... So the more I like look into what's coming out of the Pike future tech-wise, my brain just always goes to the uh, this conclusion that we're inevitably going to live in Ready Player One world um, or have that as an option do you guys agree with that or is this going to integrate into maybe more what elon musk is trying to build where like the computer sync with our brain and that the world is the world the real world is a ready player one environment that like is connected deeply to technology or you think we end up building this like separate world um where we could like upload into matrix style i don't know what do you what do you think where does this go in your mind hmm i would say that it's like I think kind of like, you know, look at technology like today and like the large landscape. It's like, you know, we're also like in a cool place where like, you know, me and Francesca were like in like such a good position where like we're able to like go to like this hackathon and like kind of like well so and like go to school and work on like kind of like this cutting edge stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you know, there's still such a large amount of like the world, you know, I, I wouldn't I don't know what the percentage would be that like, you know, doesn't even know or doesn't even care for, I would say, like what some of this stuff is. So I would always say that there, I always view it as like this dichotomy that there's always like the super far cutting edge, like, you know, the neural link, the like deep fake, this crazy stuff. And then there's like also the people that, you know, are just, this doesn't really affect them and they don't really care about it. And I think the future will be kind of just more of that. I, I always see it as this split kind of continuing where it's like, you know, there are some, there are many people that today that still don't even use computers. Um, and who's to say that like, you know, that will ever change. I mean, maybe there is a future where more and more, like we reach kind of like a, I think there's like a word for it, like in like the, in the Terminator, <laughs> like the equinox <laughs> where it's like enough people are now on the web and it's like, we all are in the singularity. I think it's what they call mm -hmm. it or something. Um, but I think 
in terms of that for a while we're still going to kind of see like a very large split for the future so until like we reach that point you're sort of describing like a worsening of i call it like cultural inequality right like there's mm -hmm. inequality obviously in wealth and income etc but there's a lot of inequality that's connected to money but in like how we're living our lives now at this point in the world and for sure and that's for sure. getting more severe and it sounds like this is only going to make it more and more severe. <laughs> uh, for sure. For sure. I agree a hundred percent. Well, I was going to say, Francesca, where do you think this is going? You know, what is this? What's the end game here? <laughs> I, I don't know that I fully agree with Alex actually, Ooh. because I think, I think, I mean, it's probably true that not the entire world is going to adopt technology. We already know that that's true. Like you said, not every civilization and society is online. Um, but it does seem as though we're headed in a direction where at least the United States, like, it, like mm -hmm. you know, just thinking about our nation, like, you know, my little brother's school is adopting iPads already. And he's he, he did the starting in elementary school. Um, mm -hmm. So if like technology is being more and more adopted, starting from an early age and like the public school sector, then most people, at least in the U.S., I would say would probably be comfortable with technology. I don't know that it's going to happen right away i think that people get really scared when they see this kind of technology and they think oh my gosh in 10 years everything is going to be revolutionized mm -hmm. by this and i think it'll be a lot slower than that like a lot of movies from the 90s and 80s predicted that like in the 2020s we would already have like flying cars and yeah, we'll be hovering like everyone would be back a robot. to the future yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah exactly exactly and that's not the case so I, I do think it'll be really slow but i think that when we get to what, when maybe a hundred years down the line or 150 years down the line, things will be a lot harder to, I think we'll have to answer the question of like what's real and what isn't a lot more than we do mm -hmm. right now. Like right now you can, you know, label a deep fake as a deep fake and that's that. But what happens when people are like, like maybe half bionic creatures and have the neural link <laughs> inside their brain. And a lot of, a lot of even their thoughts are computer generated or their emotions are computer generated. I think, and, I think mm -hmm. that, that day might come. And I think then we'll have to answer a lot of the questions about, yeah, what exactly is reality? How do we draw that line? It's a real question. And I think right now you have like the free markets kind of running ripshot over society when it comes to tech. Like we can do anything. There's no regulation, generally speaking. Social media and the Internet are melting our children's and adults' brains. Um, or I, I, mel melting is probably too negative, potentially. Depend like, I don't know. It depends who you ask. But they are changing us. Um, people are... Even our English languages, people are learning to talk and communicate with emojis. You get on a list, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, but what I do know is you guys are at the forefront of it. I'm excited to watch your careers go. I'm excited for what you mm -hmm. guys are building. Um, so keep us posted, but thank you from the bottom of our hearts for joining. This was mind blowing and a little terrifying, mm -hmm. but mind blowing more importantly. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much <laughs> for having us. And like I said, don't know if I ever get this chance. Yang Yang, what's going on? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yang Yang, forever. <laughs> Yang Yang, baby. All right, folks, that's our show. Thank you for tuning in. Before you go, one last piece of news. I put it at the end because not all of you care about this, but you should. Is that Josh Allen, quarterback for the Buffalo Bills, just signed a 250 plus just signed. million. He just signed. He's so excited. 250 to million dollar plus contract to stay in Buffalo through 2029, folks. This is so exciting. I cannot tell you. It's been 20 Eight years. years. Wait, I thought you told me it was six years. Six year extension on top of the next two. Now, oh. if you are. I'm not expecting you to be, this is, this is what I want to say. It's been 20 years, been two decades, and the Bills have been good. They were good in the 90s, and they haven't had a quarterback for 20 years. I'm not expecting you to love football. I'm not expecting you to give a shit about Zach's passion for the Buffalo Bills. But I will say this. Josh Allen is one of the coolest stories in professional sports today. This kid was unrecruited, did not get zero scholarship offers, to go to play football in college, went to junior college, still didn't get any offers, got one offer from the University of Wyoming, went there, tore it up, got drafted in the NFL, by like dropped to seventh pick in the NFL by the Buffalo Bills. He is so Buffalo. He is a wonderful Everyone human being. Everyone doubted him. Everybody Nobody doubted him. Nobody thought he was going to make it. He's a wonderful human being. The teammate, teams love him. People love him. He's a great guy. 
And he's going to be in Buffalo for a long time. And last season so this is was second Josh in MVP Allen voting. Fan so podcast. I I'm hope asking y'all are buckled you, up and ready for that. Guys, I love sports because it's a way to give so much of a shit and just care passionately about something, about something you have no control over. So I'm asking you, go on this Buffalo Bills Josh Allen journey with me for the next eight years. You're not going to regret it. And when the Bills win that Super Bowl behind Josh Allen, it's going to be one of the greatest stories Already, that already, it already is one of the greatest stories, but it's going to be probably the best story in NFL history, and I am so freaking excited. So then I'll shut up. Tune in next week. We won't talk that much about the Buffalo Bills. Uh, we love you guys. Have a great week. See you next Thursday.